I'm Coach Tarek. And I'm Vanessa. We are your movement experts and we are here to educate health and fitness professionals with the tools to create real change for and within the industry. It's Coach Tarek, co-host of the Purpose Driven Movement. In this fascinating session, I have Dr. David Bilstrom, medical doctor who really crusades on understanding autoimmune disease. David uh, and I really delve into some of the misconceptions about autoimmune disease, really understanding key terminology, including upregulation, downregulation, and set point of the immune system. We often say boost the immune system, a bit of a misnomer. Lots of fascinating um, insights, hacks, if you will, including therapeutic light, um, understanding uh, nutrition, supplementation, movement as either a good or a bad thing, and really managing that condition. Uh, really understanding that autoimmune disease is one thing, but it's really under the guise of many different names. So sit back, enjoy this fascinating episode. Check out FTI's latest offer, which is 15% off of any of our online courses. Simply go to www.functionaltraininginstitute.com and input PDM15 at cart checkout. David, welcome to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit more about kind of what you do before we dive into the nuts and bolts of it. Sure. So there is a, a worldwide epidemic of autoimmune disease, and truly there's a worldwide epidemic of all the things I call civilization diseases. So all these things that are so much more common now than they used to be, and it's made it incredibly challenging to stay healthy for folks. And the immune system is such a central mechanism, whether the body can stay healthy or not. So I specialize in not only reversing, preventing all autoimmune disease, but because we now know that the immune system disruption is part of so much chronic disease, such as heart attacks, stroke osteoporosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, and even cancer is the flip side of the same coin that's autoimmune disease. We're really trying to educate people on how to avoid that stuff. And if you have it, how to reverse the process, get rid of the health issue that you want to get rid of, and then set your system in a good place so you don't get new stuff as time goes on. Yeah, brilliant. And if we can dive into the first question, which is what are some common misconceptions about autoimmune disease that you frequently encounter? Well, one thing that unfortunately a lot of people hear if they're diagnosed with autoimmune disease, we have no idea where this comes from and that we have no idea. It actually, it's impossible to actually get rid of it. You're stuck with it your whole life. It tends to get worse and worse. And that's just how it is. And that is so not correct. The science is very clear on why people get chronic disease of all kinds, including autoimmune disease, but also the science is very clear what we need to do to reverse the process and actually get rid of it and hopefully avoid a lot of the medicines that might get used that only put a bandage on some symptoms, but actually create whole tons of new issues as time goes on, including increasing your cancer risk at the same time trying to take care of what you got going on already. Yeah. Then as I was reading through your book, there's this, you know, really simple but powerful graph of the upregulation, downregulation, and then the set point of the immune system. So did you want to touch on that a little bit to kind of perhaps illustrate it to the listeners? Yeah. You know, the body always has a sweet spot. The body's always trying to move towards the sweet spot. And so like things like with blood pressure or blood sugar, you don't want to be too high. We don't want to be too low either. There's always a set point right in the middle that you want to be at. Well, with the immune system, I find it quite fascinating is when you lose that set point right in the middle of the immune system, you actually move away from it up and down at the same time. You move away from the middle. So the overactive immune system issues are all the autoimmune diseases. Truly, there's not like hundreds of different kinds of autoimmune disease, even though there's hundreds of names based on what body parts being beaten up. It's really one disease that can attack any body part. But then you also have, as the upregulated immune system issues, things like allergies, asthma, eczema, the skin issue. And so if you ever see any of those, you know that you've lost your set point and you're showing some upregulated immune system issues. But the downregulated immune system issues are colds and flus and infections, getting the same infection over and over again. So like in a child or adult, do you get like recurrent infections like ear infections, strep throats, sinus infections, UTIs, you know, you, you get your yearly bronchitis pneumonia. Those recurrent infections are part of this disruption. The infections that drive chronic disease, and we now know that infections are part of all chronic disease. They just tend to be 
infections that don't give you fevers and the real obvious infection, they create this chronic smoldering inflammation and disease. And then one of the most common things on the under active immune system issues is cancer. And we have a huge epidemic of cancer, including a shift of cancers that may only have been seen in older people, now being seen in young people, kind of the thing. So super common to have this disruption of the immune system. Sure, yeah. That's a great picture you've painted. So if we take an example of, let's say, movement professionals, you know, fitness pros, et cetera, we know that often if someone's suffering a cold or a flu, you kind of rest it off and, you know, you might have a day or, or a few days off training per se. But is there any advice for those who suffer autoimmune diseases in terms of exercise prescription, since it's an upregulation of the immune system? Is there any research or certainly insights from your perspective in terms of how intense should one exercise with a particular autoimmune disease that's obviously prevalent for that client, for example? Yeah, you know, in general, when you're looking at trying to get the body healthy, trying to reestablish the set point or maintain the set point in the first place, you know, exercise is basically good for what ails you. You know, it's such a great thing for prevention. It's such a great thing for health in general. Though, when people start getting these relatively complicated chronic health issues that involve the immune system, there's a hormone called cortisol. They call it the stress hormone made by the adrenal glands on top of the kidney. That ideally, cortisol is supposed to convert to cortisone. So, it's one of the things the body to keep away excessive inflammation, keep the body healthy and happy and all this kind of stuff. But when you have all these different things that are disrupting this immune system set point and putting you in a position for all these health issues or getting the health issues one after another, is cortisol can become so disrupted that exercise can actually start beating people up rather than building them back up. So I'll see things like, geez, I try to exercise and I have terrible pain for four days. Or I try to exercise, I got to take a nap. I am so darn tired, I can't even keep my eyes open. And this is where people get stuck in a position where they can't exercise their way out of this stuff anymore because exercise actually beats them up. And so in those folks, we talk about shifting from more aggressive exercise to more contemplative exercise, like maybe, you know, Tai Chi, maybe yoga, you know, meditation, walking outside, those kind of things, trying to get some of the benefit of exercise, you know, physical mind body benefit, but without stressing the body enough that it actually beats you up. Now, as you actually heal the whole process, one of the great things we like to see, and kept putting like somebody that I saw today, she goes, oh my gosh, I can start to exercise again. I did that my whole life to stay healthy, and then it started beating me up, and I would be in bed for a week after I you know, did a, my regular workout. I can now start exercising, and I feel it build me up. I feel better after I exercise rather than worse. And we go, fantastic. That is a huge hump to get over, and now you got exercise again to start you know, resetting the system once you can kind of get over that. Sometimes the body's so beat up, even exercise can beat it up worse. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, especially for the listeners who are physical trainers, you know, to kind of be mindful of the repercussions of intense exercise. And often we talk in gears where, you know, fifth gear is quite intense. And so, you know, read the signs, as you said there, David, uh, if someone finds it, you know, three or four days, they're still in pain, their joints are stiff or sore. It's not necessarily DOMS, right? It's certainly um, extra inflammation as well as extra fatigue, whereas exercise ordinarily will energize you. So I think that's a really crucial point of advice, perhaps even working in with a GP who can really get to the root cause of it, which I want to tap into your world now, you know, being a medical doctor. What are the general attitudes, of course, in America or anywhere in the world that you've seen in terms of understanding and perhaps even treating autoimmune diseases? You know, what's just the general consensus without sort of picking on any one individual, if you like, or organization? So more classic autoimmune diseases have a big involvement in what they call the adaptive immune system. So the part of the immune system that can make antibodies to ideally attack things that are not us that could hurt us. So like if a cold virus gets in us, it's not us, it's just going to hurt us. So the immune system should make a very specific antibody for that specific virus to attack it, kill it, get it out of our system. So we might have a cold for four to five days, four to five decades, right? It just sits around, but then the immune system can get confused and actually start attacking our own body parts and basically you're self-destruct. And so never a great idea to self-destruct, quite counterproductive if you're trying to stay healthy, you know, to self-destruct. And so when you start attacking a body part, like in rheumatoid arthritis, You'd have joint stuff, Hashimoto's, you'd have thyroid stuff, could attack the brain, the skin, psoriasis is attacking the skin, all this kind of stuff. So you lost your set point, you moved away, but you're presenting with a lot of overactive immune system things. And so typically the only option that people are offered, and there's really nothing wrong 
wrong with this option, but what's wrong is that it's the only option offered are these medicines that suppress the immune system. So they take you from being too high, and in their attempt to bring you down, kind of get rid of the overactive symptoms, they actually push you all the way down to the bottom. And so they'll say things like, well, this is the only option you have. It's going to take care of a few of the symptoms. It's not, yeah. you're not going to feel great typically because you got a lot of other stuff going on at the same time that you might have, you know, this particular autoimmune issue that's bugging you. You may have fatigue and insomnia and gut issues and, you know, things like this. And brain fog is so common. The brain always gets dragged into the mess. But by pushing you all the way down, ideally, then the patient is told, oh, by the way, though, this is going to increase risk of cancer. This is going to increase your risk of a life threatening infection because your immune system is so suppressed. You may get a common cold and infection. No antibiotic can get rid of it and you die of this infection. But then also, it can actually give you a new autoimmune disease as a side effect. And so, when you look at this and you see this immune system dysregulation, and now this medicine makes it more likely to get a life threatening infection and cancer, you go, geez, that doesn't seem quite right. You know, here I am with this disruption immune system. I'm already at a profound increased risk of cancer just because of the disruption of the immune system set point. And now I'm on a medicine to make it more likely I got cancer. That really doesn't seem quite right. And what your body kind of says is, well, I agree. Because the body doesn't really want immunosuppression. It wants immunomodulation. It wants rebalancing of that immune system. Bring it back to the middle. And then you get rid of the up stuff. You're getting rid of the infections that are drought and chronic disease. But you're also doing your due diligence to really get rid of cancer risk. Kind of the same as well. So if you can't get through your day because your joints are so sore, you can't get through your day because you know your skin is so disrupted, you can't get through your day because your brain is so involved with this stuff, or I got an autoimmune disease of the gut, I'm pooping 25 times a day, but you got to do something to get through your day. And so if you use these meds, it's okay, but you only want to use them sort of as kind of like to get you through your day and then go back and buy yourself time to figure out what's really going on with disrupted the set point, get it back to the middle. Ultimately, you feel a ton better overall including the autoimmune process is a ton better than just the medicines will do. But then now you're in a position to get rid of the meds and now you've got rid of, you know, something that's going to give you new autoimmune disease, give you cancer, life-threatening infections. So you're actually able to come off the meds eventually. Unfortunately, most people don't know there's any other option than just the medications themselves. Yeah. So your approach is to look at the, get back to the immunomodulation, that sort of set point. So how does your approach then, David, differ if you like, or what's the unique approach that you take? I'd like to be very clear. This is not one person's opinion. This is actually the science. Okay. And I think it's very important. So even in the book that you're so kind to have read of mine, even though it is for medical people, but it's also for non-medical people, I include a hundred different scientific references as kind of an example of, well, this is what the science tells us. And it's very clear. And so it's very specific things that tend to cause this loss of a set point. Things like gut disruption, cortisol, stress hormones off, the infections that drive chronic disease, the gut disruption drives food sensitivities, and then they start creating inflammation, hormone imbalances or deficiencies, environmental toxicity, a lot of lead, mercury, arsenic, you know, flame retardants, they really like to ding the immune system. And so there's very specific things that a perfect role we like to test for. In a perfect role, we say, hey, let's test and don't guess, because even though we know what disrupts the immune system, everybody's a little different. Okay, so you might have a vitamin deficiency, which one? Okay, you know, I might have a hormone deficiency. Okay, which one? You know, that kind of thing. But truly, we know so much about this in my book and all the stuff that my YouTube videos and all this, we're really trying to teach people where this stuff comes from, like the free online educational email course we have. Well, this is where this stuff comes from. This is also how you correct that. So ideally, we're trying to give people the tools to correct it themselves. Well, this is how you fix the gut. Well, this is how you do this. And by addressing those items, you start rebalancing that immune system. The person's feeling better and better and better and better symptom-wise. And then eventually, hopefully, you're in a position where the whole thing's been reversed. Now you can come off the meds. Or if when you're diagnosed or you have this chronic health issue, maybe you're not quite down so much. Do you have to use these meds? Well, that actually makes it easier in general not to have those meds on board, but we can rebalance the immune system, really turn everything around. So suffice to say, it takes a few things to get this kind of set point again, and that could be achieved over months. So obviously, in terms of the psychology of it, it's it's important to sort of frame it up to the expectations of that patient client, for example, to say, well, this is a journey. And do you see some obviously variability perhaps in terms of that achieving set point again? There must be a lot of variation in terms of how long someone can be cured, if you like, or achieve set point again. 
Yeah, and part of it depends on kind of how long everything's been around. You know, unfortunately, by the time somebody develops a, a significant chronic health issue or autoimmune disease, you know, the body is so smart, it usually takes about 10 to 20 years for the first symptom of a chronic disease or chronic autoimmune disease to show up after the whole process has started. The body's been fighting the fight, trying to reset itself, trying to fix things. You know, the person themselves might be using exercise, nutrition, all this kind of stuff. Well, a decade or two in, if the body just can't quite get a hold of this, well, eventually you go, geez, where is this you know symptom coming from? So really, they've been around a long time by the time you actually feel something or actually get diagnosed. But the body is so smart, you can have something for 80 years and the body always knows how to fix it. It always is trying, but something's gotten in the way of it healing. You just got to figure out what's gotten in the way, like the thing we meant to get out of the way. And the body goes, oh, thank goodness. I finally have my opportunity. I can fix this thing. Now, sometimes, especially with people who, who you know do a lot of great self-care stuff, people working out regularly, trying to eat healthy, trying to manage stress, they've always set a really nice foundation. It might not have been enough to prevent them from getting this or to reverse it once they get it, but you always know they set a good foundation. So like when we do labs in these people, I'll be able to point out, well, this thing right here, that is never good like it is in you, unless you were doing this great stuff. And this over here, that is never that good unless you did what you did. So you, even though it might feel like what you've been doing hasn't really been giving you much bang for the effort, why have I been doing this? Because I didn't see it helping. I'm like, no, 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 no. It is setting a great foundation to build from. We just got to figure out what you're missing. And so sometimes, so like, let's say we run some labs. We say, well, let's make these changes based on the lab results. And now we'll be months we make these changes. We'll recheck the labs in three months. Or we're going to see what's getting better, what's not. And that'll guide us on our next step. Well, sometimes people come in and go, oh my gosh, I'm already like 50, 60, 70% better. Oh my gosh. And I'll say, fantastic. The body's so smart. See, the whole time you had this, the body knew how to fix it, was trying to fix it. We just got some things out of the way that were big players. And already within a couple of months, you, you know, it's a profound change. Now, in those folks, we may see some profound changes in labs. We might see some mild changes, but we go, great. You know, we can see the changes on the inside, but you're feeling a ton better on the outside. Now, the corollary could be that we repeat the labs and see a lot of good changes inside, but there might not be feeling a lot better on the outside yet. And we go, okay. Well, everybody's different. Everybody has their own sort of pace of healing. So what we can see on the inside with these labs, we're already getting what we want. So we're going to stay the course, but we'll tweak what we're doing to try to get you the symptom relief that kind of matches what's going on on the inside. So sometimes people change a lot more on the outside, even before the insides have changed a lot. But the body is so smart, a little change in the inside can make a big difference. But other people, it's kind of like slow and steady wins the race. But we can see in the labs, let's say that, oh yeah, that's getting better. Oh yeah, you fixed that. Oh, look at this getting so much better. Whoa, and your body's really going. It's just a matter of time before you then feel profoundly better on the outside. So suffice to say that if someone's unbeknownst to them, they're suffering and then they're, they're frustrated because they're you know training, they're meditating, they're doing all of these sort of healthy habitual things, but that's sort of giving them the credit, isn't it? So the idea is that they become perhaps more robust or you know in terms of their immune system, more resilient so that when they do get this, go through this treatment process, they're more likely to to accelerate recovery, which is what I've heard earlier. So for those listeners, they give up on that. I've, I've also suffer from some psoriasis. So those listeners, I don't hide from things like that, but I do the right things. I meditate. I don't train too intensely because I know that if I do presently, it's not good. So it definitely aligns with what you've said. So it's a bit of an interesting journey for me to have gone through or going through, yet knowing that the things I'm doing are great and the people that I'm encountering like yourself are, are certainly championing this preventative, you know, more functional, if you like like a healing process. So it's very, very powerful what we're discussing here. Sure, if we've got some of the common autoimmune diseases that everyone should be aware of, we'll touch on that. You talked about eczema. Are there any sort of common imposters that tend to be prevalent amongst the umbrella of autoimmune diseases, David? So, you know, you, you hear a lot about psoriasis, of course. You hear a lot about like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's, the autoimmune disease of the gut, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, also uh, multiple sclerosis one of the autoimmune diseases of the brain. Now, 70% of all autism is also one particular autoimmune disease that goes after the brain. And that's something that most people don't know. So those tend to be some of the most common ones. But because the immune system is so involved in inflammation control, this is the other part of the immune system. The antibody production is the called the adaptive immune system, but the innate immune system is involved in inflammation control. And wherever we have excessive inflammation that the body can't get rid of, we're going to have a health issue there. So this is where we now know that this autoimmune disruption is also in heart attacks, 
strokes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, osteoporosis, pretty much every chronic disease uh, is going to have this immune system component to it. We didn't quite know that when I started this journey, but kind of as the journey has gone, I'm like, oh, fantastic. It, actually, the immune system is even more important than I thought when it comes to all this kind of stuff. And so anytime somebody has any chronic health issue that you don't want, of course, it's an immune system disruption, either not letting you get rid of the inflammation that's creating tissue damage, or you're actually making antibodies creating the tissue damage itself. So this is where this is really pertinent for every chronic disease, not just the traditional autoimmune diseases that people might be more familiar with. And in terms of tackling it from a nutritional food component, you do give general guidelines and then you advise on particular blood sampling to kind of then get knuckled down on particularly some allergenic type uh, foods. Have you got anything to maybe share with the listeners about your approach on the food side of it? Yeah. So with the gut being one of the central mechanisms, I'd love to talk about what people could do to make sure their gut stays healthy forever and kind of undo some stuff that gets passed on from generation to generation. But when the gut gets disrupted, it can become leaky. This intestinal permeability disorder and a whole lot of things happen because of that, including you start developing food sensitivities. Now, there's two major ways that food bother people. One is immediate and it's delayed called hypersensitivity reactions. And so the immediate hypersensitivity reactions, people can figure this stuff out better than any test we have. Typically, if you're being tested for this, it's a skin test. Wholly unreliable. A person's better than any skin test to tell you what bugs you immediate because a person says, geez, you know, every time I eat this, I just don't feel good. It happens quick enough that I can tell myself. It's like a kid eating peanut and having a peanut allergy and they've got to go to the burns room. Well, that's a very dramatic example, very obvious, but also could be much more subtle like, geez, every time I eat ice cream, I get gassy. Well, there must be something in there that's kind of disrupting the system. You also got sneaky ways that foods can bug you. A little bit like those infections. Is this infections that give you obvious disease, fevers, and this kind of stuff. There's other infections that get sneaky disease, chronic, smoldering inflammation. Well, the same thing with the food. So on the delayed hypersensitivity reactions to food, it's only the food proteins that you It's not the fatty acids. It's not the carbs. It's only the proteins. But you eat this particular protein, and then days later, or up to a month later, you haven't even eaten the food for an entire month, but the proteins are still circling in your system. And all of a sudden, a month later, it whacks you by creating inflammation. Well, if you don't know it's bugging you the sneaky way, because maybe it doesn't bug you right away, but it bugs you sneaky, well, you keep eating it. And the inflammation grows, 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 grows until somebody goes, geez, you know, where is all this inflammation coming from? Why am I getting these health issues? I know it has to be coming from something. It always comes from something. But one thing I know for sure is it's not what I'm eating. It's not that makes me feel sick. Well, it doesn't make you feel sick in the obvious way. It's making you feel sick slowly but surely in a sneaky, delayed hypersensitivity way. And this is where if you have autoimmune disease, we know for sure you've developed this delayed hypersensitivity reactions to the proteins in wheat. There's 62 different kinds of wheat proteins, gluten one, and you develop reaction to cow's milk dairy protein. Butter's great, 99.99% fat, and it's actually an incredibly great fat for the gut. It's not the proteins. We don't worry about butter, but you have those. Now, there's a few other health issues where we can say, oh, I know this one food or that food bug you. So like if somebody has recurrent canker sores, mouse sores, what well, we know is a weed issue. If you're an adult with acne, even a little bit, you've got a weed issue. If you have enough brain stuff going on, whether it's memory, concentration, anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, migraine, seizures, you name the brain thing, we know you got a weed issue. If you're a teenager with mild acne, it could be a million things. But if you have moderate to severe acne, you have a weed issue and probably nine times out of 10, a cow's dairy issue. So when you look at those kind of things, if you got any of that stuff, we go, okay, well, go ahead and get rid of the food protein we know is about in the sneaky way. And let's see how you feel. And when I see him back, let's say in six weeks after the first visit, after saying, hey, you got these issues, let's get rid of these couple proteins, food proteins. If somebody comes back in six weeks and goes, oh my gosh, you got the kin. I am feeling so much better already. Who would have thought that simple change would have made such a big difference? I'm like, I know, I know your body's fantastic, right? It can heal. It was waiting the entire time for this opportunity. But if somebody comes back and goes, eh, you know, it kind of helped a little bit. You know, maybe my gut's a little healthier, but you know, not a whole lot. Well, then I say, well, we still know that was bugging you just because that's how it's, we probably got other foods bugging you too in this sneaky way. So that way you can do is even either do a food sensitivity test, which typically is a little finger prick test. You fill on a couple of little blood spots, you let it dry, you mail it to a company and a common one people can order on their own online will test for 96 different foods. And you can pinpoint in exactly foods are bugging you the sneaky way and which ones aren't. So then we say, okay, great. Well, that's why you didn't get a whole bunch better, but just getting rid of those first couple because you got these other guys doing it. Well, now let's get rid of them temporarily. 
And when you get rid of the foods that are bugging, sneaky, and of course, avoid the ones that you already figured out and bugged. But now you've opened up this window of opportunity to fix everything, including then one summary is about 80, 85% better overall. Like everything that was bugging them when you first met, 85% better overall, because everything's always connected. No matter what health issues you got, they're always all connected and they're always in a position to get better at the same time. Then we say, great, you're that much better. That's a really good chance we feel the gut enough that now you fix these foods. So now we can start bringing them back in one at a time in a special way called a formal food challenge. And then your body gets to tell us if it's ready for that food based on kind of how you feel. The other thing you could do is play the odds and do what they call an elimination diet. So what you're doing with elimination diets is you're tending to get rid of the foods that tend to bug people in this situation. And you're including in your diet the foods that don't tend to bug people. And even though it's a bit inexact because everybody's super unique, you know, so one food that may bother a lot of people may not bother you or a food that tends not to bug people in this situation may bug you. Well, that's okay. The body is so smart. We always are talking about, well, you don't need to be perfect, just perfect enough. And even though the elimination diet probably is not perfect for the individual, it's close enough. You do the elimination diet, you're 80, 85% better. Then we start bringing foods back in that you'd eliminated on the same way we would with the food sensitivity test. And that's a real big thing that can get missed a lot because the foods are bugging you so sneaky. People go, well, no, the foods are, nothing makes me feel sick. Well, not, it just doesn't do it the obvious way. Yeah, it's good for the listener to understand that those two components of the sudden onset or the gradual, more subtle elements of the buildup, if you like, of uh, inflammation, for example. So we touched a bit on nutrition and in your book, you obviously elaborate more in terms of food groups, generally speaking, to avoid. But I think you know, you've got some strategies too that you shared, process of elimination, for example, and then reintroducing certain food types. So that's one thing. We talked on the sort of physical element of exercising and ensuring not adding not too much more stress on the body and the system. And you touched on earlier though, and really powerfully said contemplative practices. And I think this is crucial to touch on now. From your understanding and research, what importance does do these contemplative practices have, meditation, prayer, etc., to kind of allowing for an overall healing when it, in relation to autoimmune diseases? Is there much out there in terms of research on these aspects? Oh, explosion in research, fortunately, the last 20 years. Yeah. Which makes it so nice for people that are trying to figure this whole stuff out, right? You know, the more we know, the better. So, you know, knowledge is power kind of a thing. And so, you know, I think what maybe a lot of your listeners are noticing, it is so hard to be healthy nowadays. You know, you can almost do everything right and you still got chronic health issues. You're like, what's the heck's going on? Well, there's a couple of different things that are creating a generational stress. And one of them is the intestinal microbiome. You get a disruption of the intestinal microbiome. It's actually passed down from generation to generation from mother to child, and then child again, and all this kind of stuff. And so that's a real big central mechanism, what throws everything off, uh, including when somebody, your mother's pregnant with you, you as a fetus before you're even born, trying to set up a healthy intestinal microbiome, even before the baby's born. All disrupted intestinal microbiome of the mom will make it impossible to set up that healthy microbiome and then pass it on to the next generation. The other one is epigenetics. So we used to think that our genes, our DNA, which are in every cell and tell the cells what to do, used to be hardwired. Well, whatever you got, you got good, bad, otherwise from parent, grandparent. You know, hopefully I got more of the good genes than the bad genes because I see them and their health issues. I don't want that stuff, right? Well, it turns out it's not what genes you have. It's which ones get turned on and turned off. So they call that epigenetic, the things that alter gene expression without changing the genetic code itself. And when they did the Human Genome Project, and they said, well, we're going to sequence the entire human gene, and we're going to figure out the exact gene that causes every disease, and we'll go and zap it, and then we're free of all these diseases. Well, after about 10 years, billions of dollars, they go, oh, well, geez, except for maybe a couple really rare, familiar with diseases, 50 people in the world have this thing. It's really not what genes you have. It's which ones get turned on and turned off. So it turns out there's a lot of bad genes, got to turn them off. A lot of good genes, got to turn them off. When people are developing any health issue, whatever the health issue is, you've turned on the bad and turned off the good in every cell in the body. And this is where over time, you can get one thing after another, after another, after another, because, well, if you're telling a cell the wrong information and you don't fix the epigenetics, well, now other cells are going to start misfunctioning as well. And one reason why it's so easy to get a whole bunch of stuff going wrong at the same time. And so the things that work through epigenetics tend to be one of the most powerful things. So this is where like meditation, repetitive prayer, progressive muscle relaxation, all these different things, including getting out in nature, works through epigenetics. So you're actually turning off the bad and turning on the good in every cell of the body. So Harvard published a study about 16 years ago on this. 
you know, like, wow, meditation works through epigenetics. Well, no wonder it's good for everything because it really fixes everything. The epigenetic changes that drive all chronic disease. But this is also where if you're going to do something to help your health, to undo sort of this generational trauma, generational stuff, you want to ideally use a lot of things that actually work through epigenetics. Now, the body, actually, the body parts will make things that actually work through epigenetics. The body's making its own things that sub genes on and off in every cell in the body. So some of the supplements we might use more than others are the ones that tend to work through epigenetics. So for example, the good bacteria in the gut make something called short-chain fatty acids. The good bacteria in the gut make a ton of important things. So short-chain fatty acids is one of the most important ones, one called butyrate. And butyrate historically is tested for, as are these other short-chain fatty acids on, on the poop tests that functional medicine docs tend to do, those digestive tool analyses are so important. Well, here is butyrate. It almost exclusively works through epigenetics. So it prevents cancer five wings. It can fix lung issues. It can fix brain issues. It can fix eye issues. It prevents cataracts and macular degeneration. It's basically helping every cell in the body flip the genes the right way. There's something made by the liver called Tudka. Profoundly impactful. It works through epigenetics and it kills cancer cells in all different way. And it basically gets every cell to start making healthy new proteins. And so that's uh, the inability of the liver to make this Tudka is a super huge central mechanism. All the civilization diseases, whether it's the autoimmune disease or other things that we deal with so much more now, we're used to, such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes obesity, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, autoimmune disease, cataracts, macular degeneration, cancers, heart attacks and strokes, and then super important for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, these kind of things. And so the body will actually make things that work through epigenetics. The problem is when you get all this stuff disrupted, either you know from generation to generation or things that have happened in our own lifetime, the body has a hard time making these guys. It just can't make enough to kind of keep up with the need, including our world tends to be very challenging to stay healthy in general. It's just such a toxic world we tend to live in that maybe the body can't keep up with production needs of some of these most important things. But then if you give the body these things that come in supplement form, well, now your body's going to heal. Now it's going to start reversing this thing, including flipping genes on and off and every cell in the body at the same time. Well, then you feel a lot better. Now you've got at these central mechanisms and you've actually kind of undone things that have happened in previous generations that are trying to push you in the wrong direction. And then that's a great way to get really healthy. But also now that's a great foundation to set this epigenetic foundation, intestinal microbiome foundation to stay good for the whole rest of your life and really prevent new disease as time goes on. Yeah, so suffice to say, it's important to have some of these important practices, contemplative, meditative, prayer, whatever it could be for someone to really stay centered in their lives and whether that be get out in nature. And as you say, we're often fighting this, you know, toxicity, which is the kind of uh, from between the stimulus and response is always that ability to choose, right? And I think that's where, you know, meditation, contemplation, prayer, etc., is our ability to kind of adapt through those epigenetic mechanisms rather than things acting on us and not being aware of them. We can have some sort of at least self-regulation as opposed to auto-regulation, it seems, through a degree of continual practice. The body is so smart. You know, sometimes we tend to almost act like you got to use a big sledgehammer to get the body sort of turned around. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of medications are, the big sledgehammers, and they're super powerful, super potent. They have a lot of side effects. When really the body is so smart, you really just kind of nudge it in the right direction. You know, things that you go, all, you know, that seems almost too simple. But to the body, if you're speaking the language the body speaks, it doesn't have to be really complicated. You kind of get the body nudging in the right direction. The body just starts rolling along and getting better and better as long as you can kind of get at these really important central mechanisms. Then every body part's going to kind of respond at the same time. You don't have to go after with this symptom with this thing, this symptom with this thing. You get these central mechanisms, your body's in a position to fix everything at the same time. Yeah, that's well said and great insight there, David. And in terms of supplementation, I know with my own journey, I was trying many different things and I had herbologists, et cetera, one point or another. Now, what would be your advice in terms of the requisite supplementation, obviously, for the given autoimmune disease? Any advice on that approach? Because it's quite easy to see something and go, yeah, that's going to help boost my immune system or as opposed to set the immune system. So you don't really want to boost the immune system, you want to rebalance it. And so one of the big central mechanisms in the body 
you know, a lot of people hear about vitamin D and it is very important. Every cell in the body has a receptor for vitamin D because every cell in the body needs vitamin D, but those receptors can become resistant to vitamin D. And it's very much like insulin resistance where you may have a pancreas make an insulin to control blood sugar, but if the insulin receptors in your cells are resistant to insulin, it can't attach and do the work. And it's almost like you don't even have insulin. Blood sugar goes up. Here's type 2 diabetes, that kind of a thing. Well, in vitamin D receptors, particularly the ones in the gut become resistance, it is a real central mechanism, just mess and everything up. So to fix that vitamin D receptor resistance, and then ideally have the right amount of vitamin D so that they can attach and do the work, builds the good guys in the gut, good bacteria gets rid of the bad, it help the, the lining of the gut will actually, when this gets disrupted, create its own inflammation. And this is where the gut can become, we call the engine of inflammation. It's actually gotten so disrupted, it's actually making its own inflammation. You got this vicious cycle going and it just gets worse and worse. Well, then the lining of the gut stops making things that create inflammation, these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Big one some people hear about is NF-kappa beta. Well, now by fixing that, now you're in a position to fix everything out of the system. So the researchers back in 2016 that figured this out go, wow, you know, this is exactly what you want to do to reverse autoimmune diseases of the gut, get rid of recurrent H. pylori or C. diff infection of the gut. They almost like about everything. Like you'll do everything else too. Well, sure enough, like six months later, they go, oh my gosh, you fixed the gut this way. It is a nuclear weapon against metabolic disease. Insulin and blood sugar, abnormal weight gain, cholesterol issues. A couple of years later, wow, you fix the gut this way, it can treat major depressive disorder. Wow, another study, if you do this with the gut, it affects people's personality. They become more outgoing and more social. And the way you fix it is what we call the foundational triad of daily vitamin D, daily probiotics, which a lot of people you know, use those that have heard about it, but also daily use of that pewter rate that I mentioned. And by using that foundational triad, you fix that. And then you fix the gut in a way that allows you to fix everything, including the good bacteria that make butyrate, actually start making their own butyrate better. So you may not need the butyrate forever, of course, and you may not need the probiotics forever, because now you've actually fixed the gut. You got your own good bacteria there, and that's been reestablished. And you also got the bacteria that are actually making butyrate all by yourself. So that's part of kind of how you get locked in. And then that's a great way to stay healthy as well. Yeah, terrific. We'll have all this information in the, in the show notes. No, David, there's any information that you could kindly share, we'll, we'll attach that into the show notes, including how people can find you and learn more about what you do. That would be terrific, how they can follow you. Is there any sort of final piece of advice, particularly for those out there who are suffering from a particular autoimmune disease? What would you say for a bit of advice? I'd love to say something about sunlight. So there's some great data coming out the last few years about how important light is, both good light and bad light. And so it turns out the back of our eyes and the retina we have image-forming retinal cells, like the rods and cones. So light hits the image-forming retinal cells. They project information up to the visual cortex in the brain so we can see images, like I'm seeing you right now. But also on the back in the retina, we have non-image-forming retinal cells. Light hits them. They project to all these different brain parts, parts involved in metabolism, emotions, mood, circadian rhythms, the superchiasmatic nucleus. And it turns out every cell in the body has its own circadian rhythm, including the gut. And so by helping this circadian rhythm section, the circadian biology starts correcting, it actually corrects the intestinal microbiome, but also it projects information to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is part of that HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, adrenal gland, cortisol. That HPA axis is how the body deals with stress. You want a HPA axis that's so healthy, the whole world is crashing down around you. You're totally chill. It doesn't make you feel poorly or a disrupted HPA axis, any little thing, like even a weather change or you know a stressful event. And you go, man, I'm so tired, man, I'm so beat up, whatever it is. It helps get a healthy HPA axis. And then when that same light, ideally two plus minutes of early morning sun within the first three hours after sunrise, hitting the eyes, no sunglasses, all it takes is two minutes, more is better. You also want to hit your abdomen because when that sunlight, particularly rich in infrared and far infrared, hits the abdomen, oh my gosh, the impact on the intestinal microbiome. It builds the good bacteria in the gut, including predominantly the butyrate forming, producing good bacteria. It actually works through epigenetics. It increases the, the activity of three different genes in these good bacteria that make butyrate. So they can make more butyrate. And then the receptors on the wall of the intestine for butyrate. So the good bacteria make butyrate, but it has to attach the intestinal wall for the gut to start making serotonin, GABA, and melatonin, all this stuff. Those butyrate receptors become more sensitive. 
so the beta ray can now attach and get a bigger bang for your effort. So the use of early morning light has this profound impact on the entire system, including mitochondria, which are this really big central mechanism, but also trying to get rid of toxic light, like the blue light, with wearing blue light blocking glasses when you're on screens and tablets, and consistently for two hours before bedtime. Oh my gosh, is that an absolute game changer? It gets at these central mechanisms that we talk about, but this kind of toxic blue light and not getting outside for so many people is part of what sort of the world around us is doing. That's really making it challenging and healthy where, you know, historically humans could do a lot of bad things, smoke too much, drink too much, eat too much fried food. And then here they are 80 years of age and they still aren't on any meds. They haven't had a heart attack yet. And then here nowadays, we got you know guys having heart attacks in their 20s. Colon cancer used to be the 43rd most common cancer. Now it's the second. And tons of people under age 40 are getting colon cancer. It used to be like 65 and above. You're like, oh my gosh, all this toxic blue light and lack of therapeutic light, along with the other thing you talked about, is such a central mechanism. But I'd also think this is a great example of how smart the body is. I mean, get outside, no sunglasses no sunscreen on your abdomen for two or more minutes in the morning within the first three hours. doesn't cost a penny. Easy as pie, right? And But it has this profound impact. So this is this whole area of science called photobiomodulation and circadian biology that is so important to reset that is such a central mechanism in the body. And that's a wonderful thing I think all your listeners could help people with is nothing costs anything. Well, pair of really great blue light blocking glasses might be $30. Don't buy the $200 ones. You don't need that. But it's something you teach anybody and it's easy. All right. It is such a central mechanism. Boy, does it make everything else easier to fix when you're doing that kind of thing. Yeah. So the first three hours from sunrise, yeah. So wherever you are in the world, you've got that three hour bracket to get the infrared and far infrared rays. Yeah. So what about for sun? Try never to miss a sunrise or at least three hours within the sunrise. And what about sunset? Would that be equally beneficial light too? That's another time when there's more of the infrared and far infrared. Yeah, that's kind of where you get you know the red colors at dawn, the red colors more at sunset. Now, there's some therapeutic value from doing the same thing multiple times during the day. Some of the UV uh, rays are actually therapeutic. So doing it more than one time of the day is even better than once. But if you're going to pick one time, the morning is the best. Great to know and uh, really fascinating. I mean, we could certainly be more focused and dive into specific areas, but it's a first great forage into, you know, your fascinating uh, mind and research and, you know, being a real advocate for what I'd say is true health, at least a, a true health approach. We'll definitely get you back on the podcast at some further point, David. So thank you once again. We'll have how people can follow you or get in touch with you and potentially some notes that they can then research on their own. I think that empowering element that uh, you really bring to the table is incredible. Absolutely love this session, Dave. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being a part of our podcast community. We work hard to create content that we hope you enjoy and find valuable. If you haven't already, we would be honored if you would consider subscribing and following us on your favorite platform. That way you'll never miss an episode and you'll always be the first to know when new episodes are released. We truly appreciate your support and we can't wait to continue to grow and connect with you through our podcast.